Everything I make, I try to make easy. You know, everybody says, well, I, you know, I must go home and cook gourmet vegan meals. No, I don't have time for that. I'm just like every other working household. I'm not going to go home and spend an hour and a half making a vegan meal from scratch. I try to keep things simple and really, really easy, things that you can actually do at home. Um, of course, you know, being in the market, I'm here because I want to encourage local awareness of all the variety of foods that are available in Michigan. Uh, this is a great market, it's year round, so thank you so much for coming out at this time of year. Uh, and that's why the recipe I wanted to do today is our creamy kale soup. It's really, really popular and it's so easy. Anybody can make it and you don't need any fancy cookware, utensils, it's stuff you're already going to have around your house, except maybe the cashews. Um, the first thing when we do most of our soups, we always start with a vegetable base. We call it mirepoix, it's you know, a fancy French term. And it's basically just carrot, celery, and onion. That's your base. And for this recipe portion, you're gonna need about a cup and a half of each. So I have here just some diced up carrot, celery, and onion. And you can balance out the blend how you like it. If you're not into that much onion, you could just add a little bit of extra carrot or a little bit of celery. Or same thing, if you're not big on celery, you can reduce that or take it out completely, but you're gonna want the equivalent of four and a half cups of vegetables. And we always start with that in our pot. And we have a lot of customers who avoid oil also. So I've learned to really cook a lot of my dishes without the use of added oil. And what I found is the biggest thing is you just have to reduce your heat. I'm so used to cooking everything on high when I'm sauteing, I've done a lot of stir fries. But if you want to take the oil out, you just want to reduce the heat a little bit and cook more in the range of medium. And so that's what we're going to do. And we can turn my on here. There we go. So salt is really essential when you're cooking without oil. And the reason that you need the salt is that salt naturally leaches out the, the water and the moisture that's in the vegetables. We do recommend using a mineral based salt. And as you can see here, we have a lovely one that's locally made from Milford Spice. They're locally packaged. This is a Himalayan salt. You've probably seen it at the stores, other places. Um, it's also called a pink salt, and the reason that it's not white is one, it has not been bleached, but two, it actually still contains minerals. So I really recommend getting a mineral-based salt. Uh, Celtic sea salt is also a really, really good one, but you really want to avoid those white uh, refined salts. We're going to put some dry basil in, the sea salt, I have a little bit of garlic powder, and some onion powder, and those also can be purchased right here at the market from Milford Spice. Granulated garlic, dried onion powder, yeah. You really need the onion powder if you already have onions. It just adds, the onion powder has a different flavor profile. The question was why onion powder and onion? So the flavor profile of the dried onion powder is a little bit different than the actual fresh onion cooked down. So, and it balances really well with the garlic powder and also the nutritional yeast that we're gonna add. So that's a good question. And you can also use, uh, if you don't have garlic powder, you could use processed garlic in this recipe. Um, you just get uh, diced up or minced garlic a lot of times. I try to avoid the stuff that's already in the glass jar because it's in a marinade and it really changes the flavor. So just a couple peeled garlic cloves, minced down by hand or put into a little tiny food processor and you can have your processed garlic. But it'll give you a similar flavor. Um, but I think it's easier for people just to use the garlic powder, so that's why I just encourage going that route, because you probably have it sitting in your spice cabinet already. So these vegetables are going to cook, and it's going to take about 15, maybe 20 minutes, depending on how high your heat is. And what you're looking for is, I say that you want the onions to be translucent. And that just means that, you know, that, that bright kind of white color, we use a Spanish onion, so it's a yellow. You want that to be um, almost clear, so translucent. And that's kind of your indicator that your vegetables are almost cooked enough. I like to keep them a little al dente. I don't want it to kind of mush into the soup. So we're just going to let that cook for a couple minutes. You know, just keep your eye on it. If it starts to stick, just turn your heat down a little bit. Because that's really, without the oil, right, you're going to have a little bit more of that sticking on the top. Just keep your heat down a little bit, and it'll be just fine. But you do want to keep stirring it. So that's our base. As that cooks, we're going to do the liquid part of the soup. And for vegan soups, you know, everybody loves, well, not everybody, but for the most part, everybody loves a good, hearty, cream-based soup. Like, who doesn't love creamy broccoli? Who 
who doesn't love a good hearty chowder? You know, my favorite soup before I went plant-based was a New England clam chowder, and that was really the inspiration for making these cream-based soups, was that I loved eating a nice, heavy bowl of a dairy-based soup. And a lot of people, they might choose to eat no dairy, but a lot of people are lactose intolerant, and if you have not been able to have a dairy-based soup, these cream-based soups are so satisfying for that, just that hearty, rich flavor that you're looking for. Now, you're gonna have to blend the base. You don't need a fancy blender, you can just use a regular, you know, $30, $40 blender. It's not gonna be really thick, and all the ratio is, now on your recipe it says two cups cashew, eight cups water. We're gonna do that twice. So we're gonna blend one cup of cashew with four cups of water, okay? So we're gonna start, I'm gonna fill my blender up to the four cups. Now you could use vegetable stock, but my thing with the vegetable stock is this, if you buy it, it's loaded with sodium. If you make it, you can make the reduced sodium version, but most people don't have time to sit around and cook vegetable stock, and you probably don't have enough scrap of vegetables around to make the stock. So I just try to avoid it. That's why we use the garlic, the onion, and the nutritional yeast. It's gonna lend that flavor that a vegetable stock would without all the added sodium. You know, we already have salt in this. We don't need more um, out of the vegetable stock. And it's, it's just more money when you can use water versus the vegetable stock. So we're gonna put about a cup of cashew, and you want raw cashew. And the reason is, is if you use a toasted cashew, it's gonna change the flavor. But once you cook nuts, it does change the nutritional content. So we just try to stick with raw nuts. Now you're gonna have to bear with the noise for a moment, because this is gonna blend, but I want you to realize how long it really does take to blend to get that creamy texture. If you're making a cream, a cream based soup for somebody, maybe this is new to them, and you're like, oh my gosh, you gotta try my creamy kale soup. <laughs> if it has gritty texture all through it, they're not gonna like it. And everybody, for the most part, is very texture sensitive on the palate. So making sure that this blends thoroughly is really important for this recipe. And if you ever come to the restaurants, you sometimes will hear in the background this blending that's going over and over because we're making huge pots of soup and we literally just have one little blender so it's like that batch blends, dump it in the pot, that batch blends. So it does take almost about a minute so I'm gonna let this run so just bear with the noise for a moment. That's a very good question. A great old, so the question was um, if you cannot have nuts, maybe it's an allergy or also nuts are high in fat. The alternative for this recipe would be sunflower seeds and you again, I would recommend getting them raw the sunflower seed does have somewhat of a bitter flavor quality to it. So what we do is we add just a splash of maple syrup, just pure Michigan maple syrup. I don't like to use cane sugar. We'd rather use a regional sweetener. So there's a, there's a quality of the bitter sunflower seed and the sweet maple syrup really balance each other out and you lose that bitter quality. So yeah, I would say about a tablespoon, maybe two of uh, maple syrup and the same amount of sunflower seeds and you can make this nut free. Yeah. You can use local honey to keep You could use local honey, yes. Honey does have a little bit sweeter of a flavor than maple, so maybe a little bit less. Yep. And remember, you can always add more, right? Once you put something in your recipe, you can't take it out. So if you just start with a little bit, mix it up, let it cook for a minute, and you can also smell the kind of the bitter quality of the cashew, or I'm sorry, the sunflower seed. When it's cooking, it has a distinct smell. So when you add in that sweetener, that smell should balance itself out. Okay, I'm gonna blend this really quick. <coughs> Now we have liquid base 
of our soup. Now your vegetables, again, you want to make sure that those onions are starting to cook down, that they're losing that bright color, and we're getting there. We're at probably about 10 minutes, so I'm going to let that go for another minute before I add the liquid. Now, one of the things that I personally believe is that greens should just be their own food group. People who eat vegetables, people who eat a lot of greens, there's a big difference in the nutrients that you actually get out of consuming greens versus vegetables. And there's a lot of research on this, but I'm a huge promoter of eating greens every day. You've got to have greens in your diet. And there's so many different greens, and there's so many greens that are locally available. If you have grown kale, you know that you start harvesting your kale, and kale's never a plant that you want to uproot. You want to break the stems off because the kale plant will keep growing throughout the season. So you might start harvesting your kale in August, but that plant's going to keep producing kale all the way into November, depending on the weather. So it's such a cheap green to be able to grow yourself and have accessible. And if you're not into farming or you don't have the space or the land, this is a great place to come and get local greens throughout the season. And you'll start to see that, wow, there's kale into like December and January, depending on the weather. <coughs> Leafy greens are amazing. And they're also a superfood. You know, there's a lot of talk about superfoods. And basically all that means is that by eating one serving of a food, you get a lot of nutrients out of that green or that food. So kale can be a little intimidating for people, especially if this is new to you. You might not know what to do with it. You might be confused or feel overwhelmed because that's how I felt when I changed my diet. I did not eat this way when I was young. I was not raised this way. I was raised on fast food and frozen food, and that was what led me to eating this way. And at first, I had, the only, actually the only time I had ever seen kale was at like a diner, like a ram's horn or something. It was like a raw piece of kale garnish on the plate, and that was the only time I'd ever seen kale in my whole life. At this point in my life, I can't imagine my life without kale. And so when you buy it, you know, it'll be usually in a little bunch like this, and you don't want to eat the, stay, uh, the, the stem. It's just too fibrous for us to digest. So that's really important. It's, when you get this, this is called like a curly kale. This is just kind of a standard basic kale. But that stem, you don't want to dice it up. You don't even necessarily want to blend it because it's just so fibrous for our intestinal tract that I just don't recommend eating the stem. You can juice it because when you juice, you're separating the fiber. So maybe you do eat a lot of kale. If you make juice at home, it's a great way to add a little bit of greens into your juice. But for the most part, you're just going to discard the stem. And the easiest thing to do to prepare your kale, you of course want to rinse it. And you just want to hold the stem with one hand. And with your other hand, you're literally just going to run across the vein and separate your leaves. So now you have just that little bit of stuff, and that's okay. You just don't want this big piece, right? So you can just go through, and this is a great activity for kids, and a great way that kids can help you and be involved in the kitchen. And you just go right down each piece, small, big, and you just separate all your kale. And the kids can also help, instead of chopping this with a knife for your soup, you can just tear the leaves apart. And that's something that they can do. And when kids are involved in the kitchen, they're really excited about trying it. It's really hard to get kids to eat. And I run restaurants, and I have healthy people who come in. I have parents that are healthy. And even they struggle with having their kids eat healthy. If you didn't raise your kids from the very beginning eating this way, it's really hard because they're addicted to sugar just like we are. They're addicted to salty and processed foods just like we are. So getting their hands involved really encourages the excitement and wanting to be part of it. Now, if you wanted to say make creamy broccoli, maybe you just don't want the kale. You could do creamy broccoli, but what you would want to do is you would want to dice up your broccoli and put it in the pot in the beginning with the carrot, celery, and onion. Leafy greens cook so fast, and you don't want to completely cook them down because you don't want to cook all the good stuff out of it. So we're going to add the kale in, at the very end, and just that hot soup is going to break that kale down just enough. I put the kale in the soup, literally when I was loading the soup into the car was when I put the kale in. I didn't cook the kale at all before I put it in here today. What do you use Brussels sprouts? Brussels sprouts take a little bit longer to cook, 
So I would saute those first in a separate pot, cook them completely, and then add them in towards the end. Um, asparagus cooks relatively fast, because you can really use this cream base all throughout the season. As soon as asparagus comes in the season, we start doing a creamy asparagus soup. In the winter, you can add you know, sweet peas, green beans, um, potatoes. I actually added some potatoes into this today just to make it a little bit hardier. So you can cook your potatoes separate and then add them in. So you can really get creative with the different vegetables that you can use. This is just your base. Where do you put the asparagus in? When? Yeah. I would put it right in the beginning with the carrot, celery, and onion. Oh. Yeah, it'll cook about the same amount of time. So we've got our first little batch of the uh, cashew water liquid base. And this is going to cook for about another 15 to 20 minutes because you'll notice that it's really liquidy when I first blend it. But what happens is that even though these cashews are completely pureed into the water, they still suck up moisture. So you want it to be really liquidy when you blend it, but after you cook it for about 15 minutes, it gets really, really thick. Like the sample that you're going to try, that's been cooked and it's absorbed all that excess liquid. So you'll be able to see the texture that you're really going for. And you can chop the kale really small or you can chop it a little bit larger. It just kind of depends on what you're looking for. But one thing that I've noticed is that when you have leafy greens in your soup and you go to kind of ladle it out, sometimes those greens hang over and they can burn your hand. So we just try to chop them pretty small. <laughs> is really the only reason. But if you, want, if you want more body and larger leaves, you can leave it like that also. Okay, we'll let this go. And 
now, if you don't want it as thick as what I'm serving you, you can leave it and serve it as it is right now. There's nothing that actually has to cook in it. It's just that most people really look for that heavy cream based soup. But this, you can see it's still liquidy. You can eat it just like this, but it's just a little runny. So I do a lot of educational classes. I work at General Motors at the Tech Center and the Wren Center downtown. Um, I work with medical students at Wayne State, at U of M, and MSU. Uh, we've realized that sometimes it's hard to reach doctors that are already practicing, but if you go to the medical students, they're really open to the idea of uh, plant-based nutrition. And you know, one thing that we actually say to people is, you know, when you take your dog or your, your cat or your pet to the vet, often they ask you, what's their diet? Have you changed their diet recently? But when we go to our doctors, they typically don't ask us about our diet. So for me, I, once I realized that, wow, you know, food could change my life, you know, I was almost 50 pounds heavier than I am now. I had terrible skin. I was tired all the time, and I was really depressed. And changing my diet within a year of that, it was a complete transformation, complete transformation. So this was a fun demonstration. You're here at the Oakland County Market. I mean, have you been here before? I have, this is my third year or fourth year doing this event actually. Oh, cool. Yeah. This was a lot of fun. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> I mean, my whole thing, okay, so a billion years ago, I'm in California and I'm just a guy hungry and I got, when I got, I got a cold, actually what happened, my grandmother used to cook for me. Whenever I got a cold, I got potato soup. So you doing this based, you know, cream based or milk based ish, or if you want, and I love the idea of changing it up with the nuts, that brought me right back to why I became a cook and started getting into it and all that. So awesome. this was really great with the nuts and the different ideas. I've got a daughter that's got nut allergies and all that, but to hear about sunflower seeds and changing it up with all that, really creative. Good. Creative. Good. I like it. And it's easy. Uh, that was an easy recipe. The, uh, really, it is. And most people get afraid of the naturalness of some of the things. And I mean, you could hear it from the questions in the ground. Well, what if I did? It's okay. You could try that. Exactly. And that's the wonderful thing about plant-based food. It's the least scientific type of cooking, especially raw. But it's it's minimal ingredients. There's flexibility. If you want thicker soup, you can add more cashew. If you want it thinner, you just add more water. So there's so much flexibility. You really can't mess it up. Right. Well, with the naturalness of, of what you're doing ingredients-wise, what what's good base things for somebody out there that's just going, I have no idea where I start this whole process. When you started today, I love that you started off with, okay, let's, let's start with the basic formulas of the Himalayan salt or the naturalness of the pink salts and, and moving in from there. For the novice, what do you suggest? I mean, just in general, I always recommend transitioning because a lot of people try to like go vegan overnight or gluten free or something overnight. I think it's healthier to just transition and allow yourself an opportunity to get familiar with different products and start with things you already like. For example, I'm Italian. I grew up eating a lot of pasta. So one of the first things I learned how to make was a vegetarian lasagna. Then eventually it moved into a vegan lasagna once I started liking vegetables a little bit more. Um, pastas were a great thing for me because it was an easy thing that I could just take the meat out of and just add a lot of vegetables. I mean, who doesn't love marinara sauce if you're Italian, right? I mean, I'll, I'll eat it all day long. So it, it was all about things I was already comfortable with and converting those to a non-animal product base. Soup and salad I could live off of. You know, a lot of vinaigrettes, they're already free of animal products. I love a good balsamic. I love a good herbal vinaigrette, Italian dressing. So all those things kind of already fit into the profile. So it wasn't that foreign to me. It was food that I already loved, but I just kind of removed the meat and removed the dairy. And there's so many products out nowadays. I mean, 20 years ago when I did this, you couldn't find all the vegan products. There's so many products now for people that are what I call transitional foods. You know, maybe you still love sausage. You know, well, they have great vegan sausages. You know, cook some sauteed peppers, some sauteed onions, put it on a good whole wheat bun. You know, you're good to go. It's okay to eat veggie burgers. It's okay to have those transitional foods until you're really comfortable with what you're doing. So do it in steps. Don't just dive into this so yes. heavy. Throw out everything in your cupboard. I'm going vegan. Yeah. The freaky of doing that. Just 
a nice transition. Absolutely. Buy more carrots. Yeah, well, that, exactly. Eat more <laughs> fresh food. Fresh you know, maybe try juices. Try things like Mediterranean food. There's tons of veggie options. A lot of like Thai restaurants have full vegan vegetarian menus. Most Thai foods don't even use dairy. It's just not in their culture. So you, there's a lot that you can kind of experiment with and try. And I, I was literally, like I said, Frozen food, fast food. That was my diet growing up. My mom was a midnight nurse with three kids. She was a single mom. Th that was what we had to do. And we didn't realize the dangers back then of all that sodium, all those processed ingredients. You know, so I was sick by the time I was 14. And that was ultimately what led me to this. And, you know, we were joking about if I drink coffee earlier, but it's honestly, I'm so amped up on food all the time that you know, I'm running around like a lunatic. So Thank you got to send people to your websites and have them check out the restaurants. Well, the clean plate is in Shelby, but it's okay. literally on the border of Shelby. So it's on a Hall Road in Hayes, basically. Okay. And that's cleanplate4u.com. It's okay. the number four. So it's cleanplate4u.com. The Cacao Tree Cafe in downtown Royal Oak. It's the great smoothie uh, juice bar downtown. It's all vegan. And that one is cacaotreecafe.com. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have a website, and we're also a local food marketing company. So our whole mission is to sell more local food in Michigan. And one of our tools for doing that is a directory. So you've been coming out to the local markets the, like this for a while and setting up yeah, so primarily what we do is work with, like we work with the farmers markets, farms, um, specialty food producers, retail stores that source local food, and basically help promote their businesses and help them connect them to other local food businesses. So if a farm is looking to sell to a retail store, um, we'll help facilitate that relationship. Or if a retail store is looking to buy more local product, we'll help connect them to some of our farm partners. Well, that's very cool. Mm -hmm. Now saying all that is there is there an actual connection between Kroger and what you're trying to do I mean Kroger says that they're trying to do local 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 sure sure so we work primarily with independently owned grocery stores so um, okay. like like a Bush's market where they're independently owned but they have several locations was probably our biggest um, type of grocery store and then we work with more like the mom and pop so there's like a, a grocery store in Flint for example the local grocer they're independently owned they focus on a lot of Michigan products those are more the grocery stores that we work with so the bigger farms not just your local little yeah, so we work with farms of all types of different sizes. Um, our only criteria for the organizations that we work with is that they're based in Michigan, they're independently owned, and they're trying to sell their product mostly within Michigan. How long has so, this been going on, this company? Um, well, we started up in Traverse City okay. about 14 years ago. Wow. Um, and we've expanded slowly across the state as different communities have asked for us to come down. So we came down to Southeast Michigan about two years ago um, and we're now hopefully expanding into West Michigan in the next year. So are you based out of here? Or yeah, you... Yep, I'm based about half an hour north of the Oakland County Farmers Market. Wow, this so. is perfect then yeah. for you. So if people on the outside want to get more involved, what would you suggest? Get on the website. Yeah, the website's a great um, place to go. So it's it's localdifference.org and you can find um, all the farmers markets, farms, retail stores in your area. You can search by zip code. Um, you can also find where we have our print magazine located. So any of our, our partners that are listed on the website, they carry our magazine. Edible Wow, who has been a really strong partner of ours, they help distribute our magazine as well. So usually we're Wherever you can find an edible wow, you can find one of the Taste Local Difference magazines too. So the magazine's probably here at the market, I imagine. Yep, the magazine's here at the Oakland County Farmers Market. Um, our new magazine comes out in May, okay. and so that'll be here as well because we publish on an annual basis. This is great, yeah. wonderful. I mean, so you're liking this market? You've been a part of this now for a few years. Yeah, year and... we've partnered with the Oakland County Farmers Market. We're going into our second year okay. of, of partnering with them. So it's definitely a market that um, I enjoy coming to. Like I said, I'm only half an hour away. So I grew up be coming here, um, especially in the summer. It's popping. Yeah. And it's it's nice that it's now a year-round market so you can get fresh local product all year round. 